Theorem 9.2 is what allows us to define factor groups, also known as quotient groups. Let G be a group and let H be a normal subgroup of G. It's gotta be normal. The proof doesn't work if normality is not assumed. That's why we define the concept of a normal subgroup in the first place. That's the symbol for the factor group. G mod H for short is what I say. It's the collection of left cosets. You might wonder, well, why not the collection of right cosets? Well, you could do right cosets as well because when a set a, a subgroup is normal, the left cosets and the right cosets are the same. But you kind of got to pick one of them. Left-handers cheer. Finally, left is over right, right? Left cosets are the preferred thing to think about compared to right cosets typically. We could think about right cosets, but we by default use left cosets. This is a group. What's the operation? Coset multiplication. How do you do it? AH times BH is ABH. Or more wordily, the left coset of H and G containing A times the left coset of H and G containing B is the left coset of H and G containing A times B. You multiply the cosets. Yes, I said that right. You multiply the cosets by multiplying their representatives. Guess what? You got to show it's well defined. This is just like the orbit stabilizer theorem proof in that sense. Our first task is to show that the operation is well defined. That is, we must show that the correspondence defined above from this Cartesian product to this set. Remember, this is the symbol for Cartesian product. So what's going on there? Maybe a little confusing there. You, you're saying you take an arbitrary ordered pair where the elements of the ordered pair are cosets and you're mapping it to some coset. What coset do you map it to? <clears throat> you map it to this coset. It's just a fancy way of, of talking about the operation that we're defining, the binary operation. Got to show it's actually a function. Why is that relevant here? Why do you need to do it? The, again, the same reason as with the orbit stabilizer theorem is because different, the same coset could have different representatives. That's why. So how do you go about doing that? To do this, we assume that for some elements, A, A prime, B, and B prime from G, we have the equality of those cosets and the equality of those cosets where A and A prime could be different and B and B prime could be different, but the cosets are the same. We need to verify that we get the same thing when we multiply cosets according to this formula here. In other words, we need to verify that these two left cosets are the same. That would mean the coset representative that's in front of the H doesn't matter. Any representative for a given coset will work if this is true, when you assume these two things are true. What's the key to doing this? Part of the key is using properties of cosets, the lemma from chapter seven about cosets. And part of it is using the assumption that H is normal. How does that work out? We'll see here. So can continue here. From these equalities, we can say this. Maybe that's not super clear. A H equaling A prime H, for example. Why does that imply that there's some element, call it H1 from H, such that A prime equals A times H1? Why does it mean that? These are the kinds of things you need to think about as you're studying on your own. It's not immediately obvious, I don't think. You need to get used to this stuff enough to make it more obvious. People who have experience with this know to say things like that right away. But you are new to this, so you got to figure out why it's true even to begin with. Uh, well, 
you could argue like this, A prime is certainly in A prime H, right? Because H is a subgroup of G. In fact, it's a normal subgroup, which we use the special notation that for. Normal subgroups are subgroups, but when it's normal, you, you fill in the, the less than sign, so to speak, and make it a triangle is the special notation for normal subgroups. This is the set of all elements A prime times H as little h ranges over capital H. But capital H being a subgroup means E is in capital H, the identity, right? H equaling E, which is in capital H implies that this is true. Okay, this is not a proof. I, it's a, it's a reason, but I didn't write it out in a logical way here. I'm trying to show A prime is in there. We, we knew that it was in there. It was a property of cosets back from chapter seven, but I was trying to re-explain it here. The reason A prime is in the left coset of H and G containing A prime is because E is in H. And A prime does equal A prime times E. But we're assuming that right there, we're assuming this is equal to AH, which is the set of all things like this. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> So because of that equality, because of that assumption, that means A prime is in here. So it is A times something in H. A and A prime are different in general here. But these cosets are the same. The fact that A prime is in here, which equals that, means that A prime does equal A times something in H. And that's what's being said here. calling it H1. By the way, you could also say, maybe there's some H3 such that A equals A prime H3. You could also say that kind of thing. In fact, H3 would be uh, H1 inverse. Take this equation and multiply on the right by H1 inverse, and you'd get that. So the H3 would be the same as H1 inverse. For a similar reason, you can say B equals B prime equals B times H2 for some H2. And that's the key to finishing it. Therefore, A prime times B prime H, replace A prime with A H1 and replace B prime with B H2. And remember the sucking sounds. Now do the coset properties. H2 gets sucked into capital H. It disappears. It's a property of cosets, right? This property, AH equals H if and only if A is in H. That property of cosets is being used right there. Oh, no, right there. The H2 got sucked into H disappeared. What fun. So you could write that. And then where's the normality used? Right there. Without parentheses, we could put parentheses in there to emphasize that the left coset BH is the same as the right coset HB. That's normality right there. Author doesn't say it. The author expects you to notice it. Got to be saying to yourself, it's good, the normality is going to be used somewhere. So what happens next? H1 gets sucked into H. And then normality again, HB is the same as BH. Should be able to give reasons for each step. But you got to be familiar enough with the properties 
to be able to do that fairly quickly. So that proves it's well defined. A prime B prime H equals A B H. Are we done? No, that's just part of the proof. We're trying to show it's a group under this operation. We got to show it's the other properties of group, associativity, identity, and inverses. Do we need to show associativity? Yeah, you should. Um, hmm. We have made multiple uses of associativity. They, okay, the rest is easy. The associativity is the last thing they do. <clears throat> Let's see if we can do it without looking. A H B H times C H. By definition of coset multiplication, A H times B H is A B H. I put parentheses there, but I didn't really need to. Just for emphasis. Now I've got two cosets being multiplied. Multiply the representatives, and for emphasis, I'll write it like this. And then I guess the point is to use associativity in the group G itself to rewrite that like this. And then use the definition of coset multiplication to write that like this. And then one more step, that's the same as this. Looks like a bunch of abstract nonsense again, doesn't it? But each step does have meaning. Here, this first step is the definition of coset multiplication that we've just shown is well-defined, multiplying these two cosets. Here is once again, the definition of coset multiplication multiplying these two cosets. Here is the associativity in the group G itself, A, B, C, parentheses can be moved. Here is the definition of coset multiplication. And again, the definition of coset multiplication. What's the identity? Mm, probably would guess EH, right? The only thing to guess, is it right? Multiply cosets by multiplying their representatives, like that. I guess that does it. Yeah, and it works the other way too. The factor group's not necessarily abelian, but the identity the identity does commute with everything. And what about inverses? What's the inverse of AH? Probably A inverse H? Question mark, question mark. Give it a try. Multiply cosets by multiplying their representatives. Hey, A, A, A inverse is E, is E. And that's the identity. Which by the way, since E is an H, does also equal H itself, right? Since E is an H, H is a subgroup. Okay, yeah, a bunch of abstract mumbo jumbo. You wanna make sure you study examples as well. I've been taking time for more abstract stuff in these recent classes. You do want to study examples. What's a simple example? Let's do a simple example. <clears throat> Let's say G is Z5. Oh, no, yes, no, sorry, let's do a different one. G is Z, the integers under addition. Z is abelian. Any subgroup of a, an abelian group is a normal subgroup. 
all subgroups of abelian groups are normal. Why? If G is abelian and H is a subgroup of G, that's going to imply H is, in fact, a normal subgroup of G. Why? You could either use the definition of normality or the normal subgroup test. It's actually probably easier just to think about the definition of normality. Since G is abelian, these products are the same as these products. The left coset is the same as the right coset. Done. G is abelian is used right there. Z is abelian, so any subgroup of Z is going to be normal. What subgroup should we pick? Oh, we can pick pretty much anything we want. Uh, how about the cyclic subgroup generated by five? In other words, all integer multiples of five. Still an infinite set there, right? Z is an infinite group. The subgroup's an infinite subgroup. It is normal in G equals Z because of what I said over here. So the factor group can be formed and the group operation is well-defined. What is the factor group? What is the factor group also called quotient group G mod H, which we could also write like this. It's the collection of left cosets of H and G as a set. What do you think? Do you think it's got infinitely many elements or finitely many elements? These have infinitely many. How many distinct left cosets are there? It's finally many. Call the first one zero plus H. I'll write specifically what H is there. I'm using plus notation for the coset because the group operation is addition in the original group. That's okay to do. If the group operation in the original group is addition, it's okay to use a plus sign instead of a juxtaposition for multiplication. This is like writing A plus H instead of A times H, so to speak. What is that left coset? That's the same as H itself, because zero is the identity. Zero is in the subgroup. Hey, so is five, so is 10, so is 15, so is negative five, so is negative 10, so is negative 15. I could use those representatives as well. well that's a big hint that this is gonna be a finite group. One plus the subgroups is a different coset. What elements does this contain? What is this coset? Take the elements of H and add one to them. Negative 14, negative 9, negative 4, 1, 6, 11, 16, et cetera. It's an infinite set, but it's just one element of the factor group. Next one would be 2 plus the subgroup. What elements are in that coset? Take the elements of H and add 2 to them. <clears throat> negative 13, negative 8, negative 3, 2, 7, 12, etc. Three plus H. Take the elements of H and add three to them, to every one of them. Negative 12, 
negative seven, negative two, three, eight, 13, et cetera. Four plus H is gonna be the last element here of the factor group. The coset itself has infinitely many elements. Yeah, five plus H is the same as zero plus H is in fact the identity element, et cetera. That kind of pattern continues. The factor group has one, two, three, four, five elements. And doesn't it feel like it's probably cyclic? Yeah, and in fact, it would have to be, right? Because five's prime. Any prime order group is going to be cyclic. This is cyclic of order five. It's isomorphic to Z5. Wow. Oops. Z mod, the cyclic subgroup generated by five is isomorphic to Z5. It's almost like the, the H doesn't matter, right? You could just focus on the zero, one, two, three, four. It's just like Z5. You might even call it another representation of Z5. I think in the lectures near the beginning of the semester, maybe four, lecture four or something like that, I used uh, equivalence relation notation here for these things. Another bit of notation, then it will be done. This cyclic subgroup generated by five in this context is often written as 5Z. And in general, the cyclic subgroup generated by N is written as NZ. And even when N is not prime, Z mod NZ is isomorphic to Zn, even when n is not prime. I hope that feels kind of natural. Technically, Zn, the elements are actual numbers, 0 through n minus 1 under addition mod n. And the elements of this are cosets. But because of cosets having different representatives that all differ by a multiple of n, you're effectively doing mod n arithmetic when you add cosets here. Keep thinking about that. Have a good day.